Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm Francois uh, Girard. Uh, I directed the film uh, and the film came to me. Robert Lantos here like, uh, um, brought me the script uh, a few years before we uh, shot it. And uh, I'm pleased to have been part of this adventure. Is that my turn? It yeah. is your turn. My cue. I'm Robert Lantos and uh, Upon first reading the uh, screenplay of the Song of Names, um, I was at once uh, motivated, strongly motivated to make this film for, for various reasons. It spoke to me personally, given I'm the son of Holocaust survivors, so this, some of the story overlaps and resonates. It also spoke to me because it, it, it's, it's a way of telling a story that to a contemporary audience. Uh, through the intervention of music that allows this 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 uh, um, light to be shined upon what took place long ago in a way that is new original and emotionally impactful and hopefully more accessible to audiences who are to those who think or who feel that the subject matter has been exhausted and to those who know very little about it so though that's, that was my motivation. Like at the same time, I felt, how do you make this film? Um, this is the whole story hinges on a piece of music, a piece of music that actually doesn't exist. It wasn't in the screenplay. The script just referred to the song of names, then he plays it, but there was no song of names. And that's where I thought <clears throat> I had an idea uh, what the, how what the key might be to solve this to open this lock and solve this problem and that that was Francois Girard who's I'd never worked with before we knew each other but his previous films his body of work both in cinema 32 short films about Glenn Gould and the the, uh, the red violin and as well as um, his work in, in theater and in the opera uh, is also so deeply enmeshed in the world of music that I thought if anybody can figure this out and kind of provide that bridge, that transition between cinema storytelling and film and music storytelling, it would be him. So I sent Francois the script and to my delight, he called and said, I'm in. That's it. That brings us to, then came of course the adventure of making the film, which is never easy, not supposed to be easy. Um, was, and we had many obstacles to surmount, but we managed it. And we hope that the result is of value to others. So the JCC Chicago Jewish Film Festival was actually very fortunate um, to be able to sneak peek the film back in December. And then we were able to show it again one time during our film festival before um, all this craziness uh, started. And it's not often that I rewatch a film because I watch a lot of them, but this one is just so incredibly moving. And I'm not necessarily a big fan of violin music or um, that kind of, of genre, but there's just something so moving about the, the whole story. And I wondered, you read the screenplay, but did you also read Norman, Norman Lebrecht's book? And did you know immediately that this film had to be made? That this book, this screenplay had to be made into a film? Well, uh, like it starts with Robert, maybe Robert should answer that because he, he came to the material before me. I read the screenplay first and then I read the book upon which it's based. Um, the screenplay I read is in many ways, it was quite different from the one we finally based the film on. Uh, in between there were a dozen or so rewrites uh, which are uh, directed by Francois with, based on Francois's notes and some of mine. And so in the end, it went through various transformations. But yeah, I, yes, I did. I knew when I read the screenplay that, um, well, I knew for what for certain that nobody else would make this film. Um, it, it would take 
I don't know any other producer in the world who would have undertaken it, which kind of leaves me, uh, you know, by default as the one who has to. So I knew that. And then I read the book after. And their book is quite different from the film, although in essence, the essence is the same, but in detail, there's a, there's a lot of differences. The, the, the mainly, the main difference being the uh, structure, like the, um, um, in, in the book, uh, between the moment that Martin has um, the first clue of uh, Davidal existence, subsistence, and the moment he finds him, then there, you know, it's a 300 pages book, and there's six pages between both, and, and Jeffrey Kane had the um, uh, good idea to expand those six pages and make it the, uh, the structure of the film and turn it into a quest uh, uh, movie. Um, and uh, I think, but we, we kept going back to the book because the, um, and Norman Lebrecht remained a very close collaborator throughout. Uh, from the moment I came in, like we met, uh, Robert and I, we met uh, Norman and Jeffrey. I met both of them actually in the same uh, few days in London and we stayed in touch uh, separately. Uh, but uh, Norman Big was a, a reference throughout, uh, both for the uh, character as a um, character substance and also is being a music scholar was also very useful to go back to. We had many discussions uh, involved in, into my discussions with um, uh, Howard Shore. Actually, Robert gave me a little more credit than I deserve because the, um, I didn't crack that song. Um, we went to... Uh, Howard Shore who became a really close partner to both Robert and I. And um, Howard, uh, well, he's, you know, the great film composer that we know, but the, um, on top of it, I think he was like Robert invested into the, uh, this mission to, um, and me, like, uh, like the mission to uh, keep the remembrance of the, these events, the Holocaust, although it's like never directly looked at, but that's obviously what the movie is about. And Howard jumped in and went back to his own childhood because the, the time that Davidol goes to the synagogue in the film in the early 50s is the time that Howard was going to the synagogue. He's a, uh, he's a non-practicing uh, Jew now, nowadays, but the, like, he went back to the times where he was visiting the synagogue and uh, tapped his, into his own memories to create uh, the truth of that song and without that truth there's there's nothing like the whole film falls apart so like we owe him a, a lot Robert you said that no one else would make this film because of the the music the subject why subject matter first of all and the, the films that whether directly about the Holocaust or as in this case uh, indirectly, but motivated by it. Regardless, the the, the the H word, the H, the letter H, in, in is is today considered uh, something that um, is a an impediment to commercial success, and so distributors and financiers religiously stay away from anything that smells or sounds like it might be about that. So that's. That's one reason nobody else would make it. Um, another reason is, look, we live in specific times. We live in a time in which uh, the current fashion is uh, and, and largely, I mean, driven by social media and the internet, has to, the, the, the social issues that govern today and that get all of everyone's attention have nothing to do with stories concerning um, white Jewish men. That's not putting it mildly. That's about the last concern anyone in the world seems to have today. So this is a story about white Jewish men, uh, two of them. And there's no getting around that. That is what it's about. And so it's very unfashionable. That's another reason why I didn't think this film would be made unless I did it. Um, I don't think I was wrong about that. And then also, but, <clears throat> if, if I may add, Robert, like, uh, and um, speaking about your uh, uh, strength and contribution here, like the, uh, the, the word we lived in in the past 30 years, uh, the independent international, um, the indie world, uh, co-productions um, uh, and others, has basically been shattered in over the last uh, few years. Uh, and it's been accelerated 
in the last year with like what was you know uh, we, we knew it was coming but it came last year the the tsunami of the streaming revolution came over a period of six nine months so it was very clear uh everything changed um the way to make movies the way to finance movies and the 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 world that robert and i lived in for a very long time is, was already like no, almost no longer by the time we made this movie and now this is even accelerated by the pandemic like the uh, um, when the, the the pandemic striked the 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 indie world was already on its knees and it's like we're all very worried of, of what will be left on the other side uh, because of course this is another accelerating factor of people switching from movie going to uh, streaming uh, movies uh, we cannot resist progress, but the, the, right now, like it's the the uh, there's so many factors adding up, and and but if we go back a couple of years, it was already so difficult to finance these films, and would it not be of Robert's strength? Robert has uh, been a, not only a, a influential producer, but he's actually through Alliance and many other endeavors created that world. Uh, he was one of the architects who created the world I grew up in. And I would not be of his strength and, and contacts and the community around him like this film would have not never seen the, the, the light screen. Yeah, we all had to pivot. That's the one of the words that's getting crossed off my use list <laughs> when 2020 is over. But we did all have to um, kind of go to the streaming method. I, I, even JCC Chicago, we've got a, a whole library of films that, um, that, that we have the ability to access through our website. And so where do you see filmmaking going beyond COVID? A, a lot of films are not even, you know, Mulan went directly to Disney Plus. Um, they keep delaying the new James Bond movie. Well, where do you think we're going to go? Are the theaters going to open or I mean, filmmakers going to be able to make a living? Well, we, we can make it a, a film question, like, but uh, we can easily expand it to other fields where I'm working to uh, theater and, and opera. Like no one knows like what would be, you know, this is really tough times for a lot of people. We think a lot of players will disappear. A lot of companies will go bankrupt. A lot of uh, people will have to, reinvent themselves in other fields but it's a you know an even bigger question i think like uh, we don't want to be selfish and thinking of our own film interests i think like uh, uh the world is <laughs> might need to be reinvented on the other side like uh, i think we're, we're going living very deep changes structural uh changes and um there'd be a before and an after covid uh, and the after has yet to be discovered, but the film on the film side, there's no doubts that there'd be like a, a very deep changes. Well, call me naive, but I'm more optimistic than you are, Francois. I think that when it comes to movie theaters, there will be fewer of them. There are too many movie theaters now in most countries, certainly in North America. There are it's overbuilt. You know, the movie, the exhibition business is overbuilt. There are all these multiplexes with 20 and 30 screens where which you don't, no one needs. And what happens is that whenever a blockbuster is released of the 20 screens in a multiplex, 10 or 12 are playing the same movie. Um, so I think there will be an attrition and a number of halls, a number of complexes, a number of screens available. But I also think movie theaters will continue. They will survive. There will be fewer of them, which I think is not a loss. Um, we don't need to see Star Wars in 10 different theaters on 10 different screens in the same mall it's okay you know it would there would be fewer screens available but i i think you know in a sense for independent films for films made for grown-ups the kind of films you and i like to make in the long run this might actually be healthy in the sense that <clears throat> the movie theaters that i think will survive are not going to be exclusively driven by the blockbusters. The fact that the blockbusters or films intended to be blockbusters like Mulan are going straight to, you know, or um, it's not the only one, they're going straight on um, out on ancillary market, direct on BOD. Um, in a sense, it I know takes the, I think it leaves room 
or, or in the future will leave room uh, for smaller films, films that don't have a worldwide marketing budget of three or four hundred million dollars, films that are not designed to make such a cacophony of noise that not, and drought, that drown, so that they that they drown out more quiet voices. So I see some glimmer of hope in all of this. It might take a couple of years for it to, for the dust to settle, but long term, I don't give up any. I don't give up hope. Uh, not but short term, um, we're pretty much prisoners of the of the streaming platforms. They rule. There yes. isn't anywhere else to go. And we, so before we, we came on, we were explaining that the end of our film festival kind of got cut short, our, our live film festival in March. And we are in the process of um, putting together our virtual film festival. So um, that's kind of where we all are right now. Let's get back to your film and put COVID aside for a little bit. What was the most difficult part of making the, the the story into a film. You said that the film um, was a little bit different than the screenplay, but what was the most difficult part? Well, uh, for me, and it was evident on uh, the very first read that the, uh, from a directorial point of view, like the, uh, uh, the combination of two characters into six actors, like because of the time span, we start these, uh, we have you know, three actors playing Martin, three actors playing uh, Davido, and uh, that creates uh, two trios or three pairs, depending on how you look at it, that, that you need to create three dynamic pairs, and each of those trios have to be very consistent in many aspects, in, in, in language, in looks, in identity. And uh, um, that was, m like, I mean, my main, probably more than half of my effort throughout was dedicated to that uh, in reshaping the script, in uh, casting Robert, like, and I went through like an endless process of casting over a year uh, to find those six, uh, starting with um, Tim Roth and Clive Owen. And then uh, while shooting, same thing, like we needed to keep the, those tracks very consistent and keep those characters alive. They're always on screen. I think there's one or two scenes in the entire movie where neither Martin nor Davido are present. So it's always about that. And if you, if you fail at that, then there's no movie. And, and then we bring it, to the, bring it to the editing stage. Still, the battle was that. And then even in ADR and into mixing, that was my, from uh, day one till the end, like uh, uh, keeping the, 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 the six actors, uh, the two parts into uh, six actors alive was my main, uh, my main battle. And it was quite, but I was, I really enjoyed it. And, and uh, I got great companions in that, like starting with Clive and Tim. So did each of the pairs, um, well, I guess Davido really, did he, in each of those three ages, did he pl actually play the violin? It's a mix, a mix of, um, in the case of the young Davido, uh, like you, you know, like at that age, you, you can, you know, you're lucky if you find an accomplished actor, like they're mainly non-existent. So um, we went through uh, like to the uh, young prodigy community and they try to find one that could, uh, act the part and then we found him in Luke Doyle and, and then he didn't need to be thought violent, he taught everybody else violent. And, um, and then when it came to uh, the two older Davidals, it's the opposite, we found the best actors and they trained to, um, but the young Davidal trained to act, the two others trained to play violin. So it was a, a, a the Davidals work, I have to say like in, in um, retrospect, the Davidals worked a little harder than the Martins. And, and add to it the accent where uh, none of them spoke, you know, like at any, they're all British actors. And then we, we, we have a, a whole path from, you know, uh, Warsaw, uh, like Yiddish, Polish, turning into English, growing into a better British English, and then turning into a Brooklyn English. So that path, like it, it was an endless journey, like to, to, finish that and make sure that like it was 
transparent in, in the end. So like they worked really hard. Well, we had a great stroke of luck because in finding Luke Doyle and he, at the time an 11 year old who had never acted before and he was a violin prodigy and who in the course of a few months be, that between the time we cast him and the time that we started the film had to learn, had to, learn to act, had to learn a poem. He's a British boy, um, spoke no language other than English and he had to learn a Polish accent and to act and um, that he managed to do that. I mean, a testament to you, Francois, for getting him there. But we, would, we also had a st tremendous stroke of luck in finding him because he is a violin prodigy. Well, I, I remember, look, I, I met him once, like, and then I brought him to Robert and we sat to a meeting with him. And then when he walked out, Robert turned to me and said, who the hell was that? Like the kid, like, I mean, like the, um, in essence, he was very close to Davidol because he has this, Luke, in his young age, uh, was so confident. And uh, I'm trying to remember how I behaved when I was 11. Uh, certainly not like that. And, and I wouldn't say arrogance, but like, I mean, there's a point where on the third or second, you know, fourth meeting even, I would like feel that I was the one auditioning. Uh, he would look at me and try to figure out if, uh, if I was worth the ride. And, the, and, and do you want to hear the music, Luke? And he would say, yeah, like, yeah, like, I'd like to hear the music. So it's like Robert, myself, Howard Shore, everybody else were, we were all auditioning for this kid who's never done a movie before. And so he was like extremely confident, which was uh, of course very helpful in creating the part. I apologize for the noise in the background. Of course, Tuesday is landscape day. So you will forgive me for the noise. Did you do any additional research for the film beyond, you know, reading um, Lebrick's book, the screenplay? Well, yeah, we all did. Uh, but my research started with Robert bringing me to his synagogue and then um, putting a kippah on and like having my first synagogue experience. And then I um, uh, spent quite a bit of time in synagogues and surrounded myself uh, with uh, great scholars and experts in language or in history. And um, Robert was a great, for me, a great resource, but there was, you know, Howard, uh, Jeffrey, not everybody had basically, I'm the, everybody's Jewish, but me in this team <laughs> anyways. And um, so like every movie is a great opportunity to learn. This one was like, uh, I had my knowledge, uh, of Ju Judaism, but I certainly like pushed it into another level. Robert, I, this is, I assume, how, how you grew up, but, or you said you're the child of survivors. And you, did your parents talk about their experiences or, you know, was it something that kind of got swept under the rug, which is super common? Um, for survivors, we, we see in, in the sort of film and, and book world that it's usually second generation survivors who are writing the books and making the films and even to, to third generation, you know, grandchildren. So what was your experience growing up as a child of survivors? My parents were... <clears throat> very generous with their stories. There was no hiding of anything, particularly my mother who, beyond telling me the various the stories of her life, uh, he also uh, dictated the whole thing on tape. And when she passed away um, at the age of 100, um, she left me these tapes and I now have some, uh, in case I forget anything, I now have some 20 hours of uh, family history. And, and of course, what happened during the Holocaust is central to it. Um, so I did grow, I, I grew up with their stories. Um, and um, it was, it, it, it's been, you know, being a, not from the very beginning, I didn't actually know that I was Jewish until I was in grade two and, <clears throat> Uh, we lived, <clears throat> sorry, we were living in Hungary under communism and my parents saw in communism an opportunity to 
completely forget all religion and be like everybody else and as an opportunity to fully assimilate. Um, and so I, the word Jew was never mentioned at my house and I, I, didn't, I didn't even know what it meant. Um, we certainly had no Jewish holidays or any kind of observance. And then I, there was an incident in my school when I was in grade two where an, another kid in my class uh, called me a, in Hungarian, a stinking Jew. And I didn't even know what Jew meant. I knew what stinking meant and I didn't like it. So I punched him and that led to a nosebleed, which led us both to the principal's office, which eventually led both mothers, his and mine, to the school. And it was then that sort of my, to my, my parents were kind of aghast to discover that I didn't know I was Jewish, but this kid did because he heard it at home from his parents who see, somehow knew my parents. So that was my first Jewish experience was that. And then I became curious and I started asking questions. What's a Jew and why would he say stinking? And I was been, that's, that's when my Jewish education began. Um, and my curiosity then was, oh, and that's when I began to find out about, not only about Jewish observance and traditions, but my parents' story. We're finding, we're finding as we're interviewing people who've made films directly related to the Holocaust, circling around the Holocaust, um, authors that this is the case for many, many people that they didn't know that they were Jewish, that the, you know, they found out accidentally or, um, you know, their parents left them things when they passed away. So, um, <clears throat> I, I find that interesting. So do you think that that experience as a, as a grade two, so you were like six or seven, do you think that, I don't know what other films you've worked on besides this one, but do you think that that, that experience played a role in you wanting to make sure this book screenplay got made into a film? Well, I have done this before. I mean, I made a film called Sunshine that directed by Istvan Sabo with Ray Fiennes, which is a story about the, the about a hundred years of the story of three generations of a Hungarian Jewish family. And I have, I made a film a few years ago with Christopher Plummer called Remember, which was also kind of strongly about similar subjects. Um, but to, to answer your question, I, it's, um, last week, just this, uh, this past week, um, there was a, there was a piece in a Canadian newspaper, the National Post, but it was reprinted from an American publication. I can't remember which, uh, the results of a survey of uh, 1000 American adults under the age of 39. Uh, and the survey was about the Holocaust. And it came, they, from, it came <clears throat> from the forward and we, we actually, we discussed it amongst ourselves. So it, it came from the forward. We saw the same article, but so then go ahead. you saw the results. Mm -hmm. Some 60% some of the respondents were not exactly sure. They knew that there was such a thing as a Holocaust, but they weren't sure exactly what transpired. 60% of those under 40. Another 10% were quite sure that there never was a Holocaust. Um, so, it, you know, my decision to make the Song of Names predates this survey by a few years, but it comes to the same, um, the, point inter, the point of intersection are, is, consists of two words, and those are the two words that um, have been quite central in my whole adult life, and those words are never again. And for there to be a never again, for them, for not to repeat the crimes and the mistakes and the horrors of history, we must also never forget. And the moment we forget, and by the way, and I mean and today in particular, in today's in today's climate, um, um, deleting history, and spinning history, obliterating history is actually very much in vogue, um, and more so than ever. Never forget, become. Um, I think crucial, especially if you are Jewish. And then, um, uh, I, although I'm not Jewish, uh, I completely share the uh, the motivation here. Um, I, I, there was a, a number of reasons why I, I might have refused to make this film. At first, I, I was 
a little uncomfortable because it was again like the violin and I'm, I'm uh, one of my most successful work is the red violin and I'm referred to uh, with that film, especially in the United States. And for me, like it was not exactly the best career move to go back to violin. And, but after a little while, I, I you know, I was, I went way, bit, like very soon I was beyond that career calculation or uh, self-interest. I think I joined uh, Robert and the others in the, in the need to remember. Um, and this is beyond Jewishness, like uh, uh, the Holocaust is a genocide and uh, it's not the only one in the century. And, and this has to, um, to, not, to not remember, like I was shocked, like with the, the stat, the, that kind of statistics, we had it like while we were prepping, 50% uh, under 35 had no clue what the word Holocaust meant. Like, I mean, the, uh, so then you realize how fast we're forgetting and how trapped we are in the present. And I think the technologies that we're using our small screens and our little phones uh, trap us uh, in, the, in the present. Uh, present becomes a prison and there's a moment where we need to step back and if we wanna be able to face the future, we need to be able to look back and gain some perspective. And I think film uh, making and uh, other mediums uh, are certainly a good way to achieve that. And uh, this is the reason why I joined Robert in this uh, um, effort to uh, remembrance. It, how do you balance, you know, making a choice between the box office and your personal values? You know, you're not necessarily getting rich making films about the Holocaust. They're not necessarily a blockbuster film. I'll say, that's putting it mildly. Um, look, I have no, I had absolutely no illusions that in undertaking the Song of Names, I knew that I, one thing for certain, I didn't know for certain how the film would turn out and whether it you know, the, the ultimate, the, whether the, uh, the, the dream could be fully realized. But I did know one thing for certain is that um, I'd be lucky if, um, it, if I didn't lose a lot of money on it, but there certainly was absolutely no chance of actually making money on it. That was, that's, that was clear. And as it turns out, that in fact is the case. Um, even it's, it's just the, the marketplace, the film marketplace, for a film of this nature is just gets narrower and narrower, narrower each day. And the, the, the challenge was this story requires a broad canvas, a rich textured canvas. It covers decades of time. It's a large cast. It's a period piece. It's set in several different countries. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's set in London, but we, so we have to shoot some of it in London, but for cost reasons, we couldn't shoot all of it in London. So that part we shot in Budapest, standing in for London, but it's also set in New York and it's also set in Poland. Uh, so we had to go to Poland and we ended up also going to Treblinka. Um, and if you recall, there's a scene in the film where I asked Francois to make sure the camera was pointed right there in the center of the Treblinka extermination facility, which we some, for some reason call concentration camp, but, but it really is an extermination facility. In the center of it, there's a monument and on it are two words in several languages. And those two words are never again. Um, and that, so we had to travel a great deal to make this film. And so me, but what I'm getting at is there was no way to make this film on any kind of a modest budget. It had to have, a, we had to have proper resources to do justice to the story. And that kind of broad canvas for this kind of story um, is in today's marketplace is certainly not something one would, undertake in order to make a profit. I want to go back to the uh, Treblinka. Uh, um, <clears throat> like Robert's right, like we're, we're playing tricks all along. Like, you know, we, we shot like, uh, if you look at the boys like going on their bicycle ride, like uh, we go uh, 
each shot is a shot in a different country and they were playing uh, tricks to um, create London and we playing tricks to play this and then uh, uh, New York uh, in the in the camper when the two characters at the end it's shot in Montreal and it's supposed to be warm but it was shot at minus 15 and so on but the uh, and while we were prepping the film, like you, you play all your cards and you do like rear projections and you do this and you do that. And whenever in the read through we came to that scene, like I, I always said, like, I, I'm not ready to talk about it. You know, my job is to give direction, you know, to the whole team and we're going to do this, we're going to do that. This one, like eventually I told Robert, I, I really need to go there. So I, I, like one, once we were in Budapest, uh, I flew there with my designer Francois Seguin, and then we we and and that week, like the the days and the days that preceded that, like I of course I'd done my research before, but like then I watched yet a couple more documentaries on Treblinka, and I, I read some more, and I was loaded with the, you know, it's not the only camps, but it's one of the most clinical, technical, and there's not no one slept a night, and uh, this whole like scheme was like just so daunting and and then i went there backward that morning like i i slept in washa and i drove to treblinka which is in uh, a two hours drive and if you had given me a choice i would have turned around i was resenting that so bad because i was feeling that i was going into a black hole and we arrived there and i found the exact opposite of what i was expecting like there was about 200 kids all dressed in white playing guitar, eating picnics, uh, uh, probably most of them on pilgrimage, like uh, uh, probably a lot of young Israelis or wherever they were coming from, I don't know, we never asked because we didn't say a word for three hours, just walking around, laying on the grass, feeling the place. And, but what I found, what I found there was a great lesson because what I found was the opposite of what I was expecting. I was expecting the, the weight of death and I found the, light of life and and it was it was almost a uh, uh, a celebration of, of of there was something um of the survivors but a, a celebration of of the will to live and uh and it was remarkable and then i called robert i said we we, we have to add a day to our shooting schedule Robert jumped on it immediately, like uh, it took about eight seconds to convince him that we needed to bring the actors there. So we flew, we added like a, an extra trip between London and Budapest and we brought the actors there and all that we did. Uh, and also the scene was written like with lots of dialogues. But when I went there with our Polish actress and with Francois, they, you don't say a word. There's nothing you can be, you know, you shut up, like you just, uh, uh, pay your uh, homage and, and then you walk. And then I came back and I, you know, I, I erased all the dialogues on those scenes, moved them around before, after, like, and I brought Tim Roth and our actress uh, who, who plays Anna. And then we, we brought them there. There was not even a rehearsal. There was no staging. It was like, we got the cameras ready at sunrise and we followed them in steady cam walking around the thing. So, this is on stage in the real place, in no dialogues. And this is the closest in the entire movie uh, we get to the, to the actual physical evidence of Holocaust, like of the Holocaust. And, and that was like, there's a, a few important teachings for me and then I was very moved in, uh, in the process. If there is one thing that you want people to take away from the film, a feeling that the film should evoke in you, what would that be for each of you? I think Robert should start. Uh, I'm honestly, I think I just, I kind of preempted you and me, I might preempted myself because I think I answered that question before you asked it. Never again. So can we accomplish something like that massive with made by making a film? Obviously not, but it's the only contribution I can make. Um, I am, uh, it's, if, you know, this is my, 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 my chosen vocation and this is my pen. 
So if I, as long as I can manage the, um, to, 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 to inspire others and rally talented, you know, a talented group to work together on, on a way of, on a, on a reminder, which is what this film is ultimately, hopefully, you know, besides being um, a story and, 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 and a work of entertainment. And it's also, it, it's, it's a reminder. So it is the, it's my, it's the, the contribution that I can make to remembering. Uh, for me, it's uh, remember. It's a personal thing, and it's also a philosophical thing. It's personal because it is, in some ways, the story of my family. Philosophical because I strongly believe that you know this the survival of the Jewish people is intertwined with the survival of the whole world. And if we don't remember the past, then we jeopardize that survival. Well, we might call it differently, like, uh, but it's, yeah, the same, like I preempted my answer, the remembrance, uh, remembrance of the Holocaust, of the genocides, you know, everything we forget as, you know, as a species, like, I think we're, we have a, we're a short memory species, and then, like, we, uh, we keep making the same mistakes, and this is one big, huge one, but it's not the only one, and I think, I'm still a big believer that film, film is, arts, like, is a great tool to escape the present, uh, the obsession of the present. And I think we're more and more trapped in the present. And uh, so my, my mission is the same, maybe phrased a little different because our perspective is a little different, but uh, essentially it's the same, it's remembrance. Well, I I'm certainly not going to forget. I, I... I've done a lot of these interviews since March, and this is the this is the first one that I don't know has touched me in a different way. Like I, I I feel like if you guys weren't all watching me, I might be crying, which is not something that I I often do, and not not in a sad way, in in a way that makes me proud that I'm able to share this film with with our community and this discussion with with people who this means so much to so i, I really thank you both um for, for making the film honestly and truly i i, I watch a lot of holocaust film, films i read a lot of holocaust books and while you've said it's not you know you talk about his parents and and you know them losing their lives. It's still a story about survival, really and truly. And, and that he goes back to his, his roots to, to remember his, David goes back to his roots to, to remember his family. So I thank you both for, for making it into a film. It's, it's a beautiful film. What are you guys working on? What's, what's coming up next for both of you? Well, as a matter of fact, I'm, I'm a presenter, like, believe it or not, like I'm, I'm, after this, I'm going to go to the theater. We're playing a play here in Montreal. We reopened. We were the first live uh, theater event in the country. And it's also another Jewish story, it turns out. Um, it's called Underneath the Lentil by uh, New York author um, uh, Glenn Berger. And uh, none of us are traveling much, but Robert took, uh, took a trip to Montreal last week to come and see it. So we just had the, uh, a moment together and uh, had dinner after. Uh, but that's been my uh, mission. And, and now we're, we have to work twice harder um, to keep things going. Like everything become, became so difficult. All pipelines are plugged. And so we need to push really hard to get anything going. Robert, what are you working on? Oh, I have projects that are basically all stalled because until, you know, for an independent to shoot a movie, we need insurance. Companies like Amazon and Netflix are taking it upon themselves to go back into production and without insurance. Um, but an independent can't do that. You know, for one thing, we rely on on, on, the, on banks and banks won't advance funds unless there is insurance. And right now insurance in North America is not available for film production. Or rather it is available, but it excludes coverage for COVID-19. 
So if a film has to shut down because someone is get sick, there is no coverage for that. Hence, every all the plans are for the future. The film, I was going to make a film earlier this year, this summer, but uh, with Ray Fines, but that that had to be shelved. Um, and so, my work now is on preparing projects for some future date um, with various filmmakers um, as to when. When that date is, it's definitely not in my hands. Well, I hope you will share whatever comes from all of your projects. We we love to have filmmakers and producers who've been in the festival before come back and share their next projects with us. Um, if anyone in the audience has any questions, please, uh, you can raise your hand. You can unmute yourself and, and ask. Um, otherwise, I, I, again, this, this, um, for some reason, this was super emotional for, for me today. So again, I want to thank you both for, for joining us and, and sharing this wonderful film. I don't think there are any, let me see. Oh, yep. Shoshana, you can un, unmute and ask your question. Yeah, my question is, uh, my name is Gideon. Uh, this, uh, Robert, do you relate to Congressman Lantos uh, from uh, California? No, I did not. I did meet Tom Lantos a couple of times, uh, the late Tom Lantos, but uh, we're not, no, we just haven't had the same name. And you know, uh, I don't know if you know, in this uh, Hungarian Jews, um, or <clears throat> around <clears throat> the time of my grandfather, so early in the 20th century. Uh, most Hungarian Jews dropped their Jewish sounding names and adopted Hungarian names. And Lantos is a very, it's like St. Johnson in English. It's a very common Hungarian name. And so it's not, it, it wasn't my grandfather's original name and same goes for Tom Lantos. His, his name is also a Hungarianized name of a former Jewish name. No questions, but lots of comments about how wonderful the film, the film um, was and just thanking you all for, you know, putting it together and uh, Susan. I wanted to know whose idea it was to have Martin say the Kaddish at the end of the movie. That was so powerful. Well, uh, it is, Robert, uh, tell me if I'm like, it is, it was not in the book, it's in the script. So we I think we have to credit uh, Jeffrey Kane for that. And uh, with uh, Tim Roth, we made, we made a, um, we made a decision that like, although like, you know, all accent and everything was so well prepared in this film. In this case, we made a like the uh, uh, um, uh, rule for the, Tim to read it first time on camera, like with no rehearsal. So he's not supposed to like be exposed to that. And so what you get, I suspect that maybe Tim cheated a little bit and did some preparation because it sounded so good in the first take, but, um, the, it was a, a spontaneous, non-Jewish read of a very Jewish uh, poem, the prayer. Uh, and I, you know, I, I'm, I'm very fond of that scene for that reason and others. Those are not easy words to say. No. There are a lot of, <laughs> even in transliteration, they're, they're tough words to say. So um, th again, the whole film was just very moving and um, heartwarming. And again, we, we are really grateful for your time and, and sharing your thoughts with us. And um, you know, we wish you guys both the very best. Hopefully things will, will improve sooner rather than later and everyone will get back to their real, um, their real lives and their real profession. So thank you again. Thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. Please check out our website, jccchicago.org.
O-R-G. On Thursday, we have two programs. One is a Frank Lloyd Wright visit. We're going to New York to Falling Water. And in the evening, we kick off our Social Justice Film Festival with a conversation with um, several people from the Institute of Nonviolence in Chicago. And that leads into four weeks of film uh, social justice film. So again, thank you for everyone that is celebrating Yom Kippur. We wish you a easy fast and a healthy and a happy new year. Again, thank you so much and take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank, thank you. you.